That's an example of the terrain. Okay, let me copy those down. Those two. Back on our book. Stop is reset. About 40 kilometers. I read up before I got it. 367. But minus 367, minus 1751. Eight degree slope is getting just about it toward their. Uh, Maximum that they uh, would prefer to have, like they can go uh, considerably more than that. But I think isn't it 12 degrees that they discussed as being the uh, thick that thread. I'm not uh, remember that number, but of course it depends on how the vehicle settles in. Uh, that's why you drop in at a velocity, so you will try to level out. Another example of why that's not exactly a nice place to land. <laughs> It was particularly important that this landing be made at this spot, too. They had a couple of alternate spots in case this had turned out to be too rough. And uh, through the technique they used in landing this time, as opposed to earlier times, they had more maneuvering time. They could have gone, moved over a little bit to some other spots, but then it would have perhaps made the transverse, the walk, and the second uh, uh, walk tomorrow, a little too far to reach that cone crater where they want to go for these uh, very old rocks. That, that should be a very significant part of their exploration is getting near that cone crater. And so Apollo 14 is on the moon. CBS News color coverage of the landing of Antares on the moon will continue in a moment. To get a better look at the landing site through the dust that was raised. Also, the time of day of the landing on the lunar day uh, gave them a sun angle of some 10 degrees instead of 6 degrees, I think, in the previous landings, which meant that the sun was higher and there wasn't much reflection in the dust. So. Uh, and it all worked, and they're down just where they want to be. And we're going to listen uh, to them very shortly as they describe the scene, uh, we hope, uh, out of the window of the lunar module. That is scheduled for very shortly. Dr. John Salisbury of the Air Force Cambridge Research Laboratory is with us this morning. And Dr. Salisbury, uh, I know we, you can tell us uh, precisely what the value of this man flight to the moon is in the sense of what they're going to find when they get now to Cone Crater some uh, almost a mile from where they've landed. Well, as you mentioned, Walter, that the importance of this mission is that it will allow us to get at some of the oldest rocks on the moon. Uh, finding a piece of the lunar crust itself, the original lunar crust, and uh, determining its age and chemistry could tell us a great deal about the origin and history of the moon and indeed the solar system. Well, this, uh, the reason that they're finding rocks at this point, uh, they may find rocks, they expect that they'll find yes. rocks of that age, uh, rather than uh, where they found them in the earlier uh, landings, is that, uh, as I get it, uh, this uh, 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 Marimbrium was formed by, a, by perhaps one of the, an impact on the moon in the very formative period of the moon, and uh, that was such an impact that threw rocks of, uh, into this area where they've landed, and therefore from 100 miles deep where Marimbrium uh, was formed, why, uh, these rocks may, may show the actual formation of the moon at the beginning. Yes, the, the reason that uh, you couldn't find such rocks or would, had a low probability of finding such rocks at the previous two sites is because they landed on the Maria. And there the lava flows that made the landing sites relatively smooth and safe to land on had sealed away beneath them the older rocks. On this site, we have uh, ancient highlands terrain that was not quite flooded by the lavas that inundated the surrounding areas. So you have preserved these older rocks that, as you say, the Framura formation, the rim of debris that uh, was thrown out of the Imbrian Basin in that gigantic collision uh, early in the history of the moon, uh, should be available. So, Dadley, in, in case anybody is curious about uh, what Framura is, uh, he was a was he Benedictine. Anyway, he was a monk uh, in the 16th century who helped map the Mediterranean. Quite uh, accurately, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they did a pretty good job of it. There uh, hadn't, uh, hadn't, hadn't been many changes, although the satellites of the uh, space program are helping map uh, all of the Earth a little bit uh, more accurately than anybody could ever map it uh, with the finest instruments on Earth uh, by uh, uh, whatever technique they use from the satellites. I won't go into all that. That's your field, Wally. We found a few places uh, a mile or so off, though, and quite surprising. The uh, Al Shepard said, uh, 
uh, just before they fired off those engines uh, to make the landing on the moon, he said it's a beautiful day to land at Framoro. Uh, <laughs> apparently, the, the excitement of this crew of Apollo 14, uh, the excitement level, has gone up considerably in the last uh, 12 hours or so, or 24 hours, really, since they've been around the moon. Uh, in the passage out there, they were among the quietest uh, of all of our astronauts, but uh, the uh, uh, excitement quotient, the EQ, has gone up uh, <laughs> quite a lot in the last few hours, and uh, both Ed Mitchell and uh, Al Shepard uh, have been ecstatic about the sights they've seen. Stu Rosa, who now is on his lonely flight for the next 33 and a third hours around the moon, uh, minding the command ship, minding the store, while Shepard and Mitchell uh, walk on the moon. Uh, he also has been exultant about the scene, the moon below. He's got an important job taking pictures of the landing sites of future Apollo missions, particularly Apollo 16. He's got trouble with his camera. Uh, they've got to get some pictures back of that Apollo 16 landing site because they don't have good enough ones yet. And uh, that's the second most important part of this whole mission. Uh, so they're holding their, uh, uh, keeping their fingers crossed in, uh, in Houston while they wait for those pictures to come back from the moon to be sure they've got good ones of the Apollo 16 landing site. Today, incidentally, marks exactly nine years and nine months since Al Shepard's first flight uh, uh, in that little redstone Mercury uh, to be our first man in space way back there in 1961. And uh, it's quite a way for him to celebrate. Let's see if we're uh, hearing anything from the men in the... Uh, there they are. And, and Terry this is the, the mission Obama control, the voice of mission control. Terry White. <coughs> you just barely see that limb in that picture there. They've got a long walk to go. If, uh, the real estate's right. That's the picture, I suppose, the view from Cone Crater uh, in our simulation. That's the uh, slope up which they're going to try to walk tomorrow. Now today, when they uh, get out of the spacecraft uh, at uh, 8.53 this morning, which is uh, more than four hours from now, about four and a half hours almost, uh, they're going to walk right around the lunar module. Uh, they'll, the first thing they'll do is uh, set up the television, the color television camera. Uh, so we hope for the first time to see color pictures from the moon. Uh, if uh, it works this time, we thought we were going to see those on Apollo 12, but as you know, they uh, unfortunately uh, turned the lens into the sun and it was burned out, and we didn't get those pictures at all. Uh, but they're uh, scheduled to, uh, to then deploy a uh, uh, $12 million nuclear-powered science station uh, that will relay back to Earth the information about solar winds, uh, solar wind makeup, uh, the seismic activity on the moon. Values for 047 and 053. 047 plus 37774. Well, uh, they're reading up uh, information for the computers now to the uh, spacecraft. Uh, what they're doing right now is getting ready for an emergency takeoff if that became necessary. They feed all the necessary information into the computers so that at a second's notice they could blast off from the moon's surface uh, uh, if a monster should suddenly appear out of Cone Crater or anything like that. Uh, Bruce Morton is in Houston and can tell us more about uh, this site that they've landed on. Bruce? me here is Dr. Noah Hinters, who works for Belcom. He's a consultant to NASA in a number of areas, but uh, most importantly right now uh, to the Landing Site Selection Committee. And he's been following this descent, looking at maps, listening to the air to ground, trying to figure out just exactly uh, where they were. Where were they? It looks like they're right on the nose, Bruce. Uh, as you heard during the descent, the ground control mentioned they're coming over North Crater of Triplet. Uh, at that point, there were only several hundred feet from the predicted landing point. So as far as we can see now, they're right on the nose. The nominal traverse planning should go according to schedule. We'll get the cone crater samples, which as you know are the key to this site, since cone is a crater which has presumably dug into that Falmaro formation and exposed the freshest rocks in the area. So I'm just all excited that we're going to have a real 
cheery mission here and get some of the answers to these key questions that have been plaguing us since people started looking at the moon. Are the answers in, in older rocks? Is that the, the point of being at this spot on the moon? That's where a lot of them are. As you're well aware, the Mari rocks from Apollo 11 and 12 turned out to be roughly three and a half billion years old. These are some of the youngest looking features on the moon, and yet they're as old as the oldest rocks on Earth. Uh, what we're trying to do now is get this time scale back towards the beginning. We have clues from the soil that there are rocks approximately four and a half billion years old. There's good reason to believe that some of these rocks will be in the Fraumaro Formation. From the Apollo 12 sample analysis, there were some mighty strange things that popped up, some mystic components. These are predicted to be part of the Fraumaro Formation by many of the scientists from the Apollo 12 conference. So there are a lot of bets riding on this mission. Uh, most of us are convinced that we're going to find some rocks there that will indeed date this embryum event and give us a good section of the upper part of the lunar crust. How much advice can you give an astronaut when he's out picking up rocks? You can't really tell him uh, which rock to go for, can you? No, not specifically. Uh, these crews are just well-trained geologic observers. They've gone through a very thorough geology training course. So rather than telling them in detail, pick this rock, pick that rock, they've been trained to look for certain types of features. First, to get representative samples of what the total area looks like. If they see all of one kind of rock, be sure you get some of that. Don't ignore the, uh, the forest for the trees. But then be on the lookout for strange appearing type rocks too, to sample those so that we get most of what's there in the, the general sample, and then also the specific oddity that sheds so much light sometimes on what's happening. Sometimes it's this odd sample that has been thrown in by an impact event from a distant site. It could come from several, up to several thousand kilometers away from some of the large impacts such as Tycho Copernicus. The geologists here had worked out a number of alternate walks. I take it from the description on the way down, uh, you don't expect to be taking any of those. There are two alternate traverses worked out uh, for landing sites other than the, the specific touchdown point they looked to have come in at. Uh, as far as you can see, they're right on the prime landing point. So the nominal traverse should be the one that they'll follow, which is, has the cone crater traverse in it. Right on the money, Walter. Right on the money, I suppose, Bruce. That means uh, uh, 3 degrees, 40 minutes, 19 seconds south, 17 degrees, 27 minutes, 46 seconds west. Uh, if they're precisely on the money. That's in this Fraumaro formation of the Sea of Rain, as it's called. They're 30 miles north of the Fraumaro crater, and as I mentioned earlier, they're 111 miles east of where Apollo 12 landed in the ocean of storms, and about 800 miles west of where Apollo 11 landed in the Sea of Tranquility. And as you look at the moon from Earth at this point, that's just a little bit to the left of the very center of the moon as you look at it. Uh, it's a, uh, a hilly upland region, as you've heard, of ridges and craters and boulders. Some of those ridges even go up to 8,000 feet, and that's more than a ridge. It uh, sounds like a mountain to me. It must have felt like, uh, sounded like a mountain to the uh, astronauts planning to land there. That's Cone Crater, and that's the uh, crater they're going to climb up the side of uh, on the second uh, walk on tomorrow morning, if all continues to go as well as it has so far. Uh, at this moment, they are still in the spacecraft checking out uh, the uh, lunar module systems and, uh, and feeding into the computer the information for an immediate takeoff if that became necessary, uh, checking all of their fuel supplies and that sort of thing. And when they've got all of that done, uh, that will take about an hour uh, till oh, almost 5.30 Eastern Standard Time. That's another 45 or 50 minutes from now. Then for the first time, they'll really give a description out the, from, the, from the window, looking out the windows of the lunar module and take some pictures out uh, the window. Uh, then uh, they go through a hour of uh, uh, an eat period. They have breakfast, in other words, and uh, then prepare their equipment for the first walk on the moon, which is scheduled for 8.53 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, by the time they get down the steps and get the color television camera turned on, it should be about five minutes after nine 
uh, Eastern Standard Time. CBS News color coverage of this third landing on the moon continues in a moment.